How's it going? This is the first ever Sideline Dissident podcast. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have actual guests on this podcast so I can talk to people, probably do it online, uh, might actually meet some people in person. Uh, but yeah, I figured, you know, I've been making a lot of short video clips with my sports opinions lately and I just decided why don't I just say it? Why don't I just talk like a normal human being? And you know, it is kind of weird. I'm having a conversation with myself right now. But uh, I think that might be a better method of doing things. Uh, and last I checked, I had uh, seven YouTube subscribers. Uh, so I think my ability to be flexible and agile is more important than putting up the same content every single day. So uh, I'm going to try this podcast. We'll talk about what's going on in sports. Maybe I'll do one tomorrow. Maybe I'll just do another short video. We'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, on the agenda, I plan on talking about the Denver Broncos. Uh, they just won a big game last night against the Houston Texans with Brock Osweiler uh, returning to the Bronco, uh, returning to Denver and it didn't go so well for him. Uh, World Series starts tonight, too. Uh, I'm going to preview that a little bit. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not going to make any predictions, because this has been a ridiculous postseason to make predictions in baseball. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody was picking the Cleveland Indians. Nobody even knew the Cleveland Indians were in the postseason, and now they're in the World Series. And, of course, everyone's picking the Cubs. So, you know, knowing, knowing that, it's probably going to be the Indians that win it all. Uh, and then finally, the NBA season also begins tonight. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Golden State. I'll talk about Cleveland situations, uh, situation and uh, the teams to watch out for. Uh, you know, I just briefly, I'll say, you know, the Miami Heat, they lost Dwayne Wade, but I still think they're going to be a good basketball team. Uh, watch out for the Boston Celtics. They're deep. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. And then finally, I'll wrap up with why this is the best time of the year to be alive as a sports fan or just a person. You know, I'm living out here in L.A. and uh, for once, it's not 95 degrees outside. So that's nice. It's a good time to just be outside and breathe like people do. Uh, so we'll start with the Denver Broncos. Monday Night Football last night, they defeated the Houston Texans. Uh, Game was over by the third quarter, uh, or by the end of the third quarter at least. Uh, Trevor Simeon had a heck of a game, and Brock Osweiler, you know, I, I can tell you the Houston Texans are starting to have regrets already. Uh, he, he made a lot of terrible throws, and Trevor Simeon, you know, he, he looked polished. He looked like a veteran out there, and you have to give the Broncos credit for sticking with Simeon uh, through all of this because, you know, everyone was saying Paxton Lynch is the future. You know, they we, they were fans in this offseason were expecting to re-sign Brock Osweiler, uh, and then they, they drafted Paxton Lynch, so it was like, all right, Broncos are starting fresh, and instead they got this Simeon guy. Now, are they going to stick with him forever? Uh, I don't know about that. But, you know, after the game, Aqib Tlaib claimed that uh, Trevor Simeon is a better quarterback, better quarterback than Brock Osweiler, uh, and I think he's right to an extent. Now, if we're judging on talent alone, Brock Osweiler, he's, he's definitely got a lot more talent, a lot more athleticism. He, first of all, he's, I think he's the tallest quarterback in the NFL. He's like 6'7", six 6'8", foot six foot which means he can see the field better than anyone else. You know, you got linemen that are there lined up at 6'5", six 6'6". Six six. He's one of the few quarterbacks in the league that, that can actually see over those linemen. Uh, he's, he's got a great arm. He can throw it accurately. He can throw it deep. And for a tall, lanky guy, he's very mobile. So, yeah, Brock Osweiler, when it comes to talent, when it comes to athleticism, yeah, he's clearly a better quarterback. Uh, that being said, Trevor Simeon... You know, he's not, he's not as athletic. I don't think his arms is great. Uh, but the instincts are there. He has those instincts that Brock Osweiler, I don't know if we've ever really seen it. Uh, and he really, he carried that offense great last night. He was willing to call audibles. And, and look, uh, I, after watching football these last few seasons, I think it's clear the most important position on the field is the quarterback. That being said, uh, the offensive line as a unit, as a whole, is far more important than the quarterback. Because you can have the best quarterback of all time, Tom Brady, 
Uh, and that's not going to matter if he doesn't have even just a little bit of time to throw the football away. Uh, so, you know, what you want a quarterback is you want someone that can get rid of the ball quickly. Um, but you want that offensive line there. So, you know, even if you're going against a Denver defense, uh, you know, Denver, Denver could be playing the Dallas Cowboys, the best offensive line in football by far. And they're still going to get to the quarterback. Uh, so it's, it's more about having an offensive line that can buy time. And... The Broncos are getting better at that. They've had their issues with having with their with their offensive line this season a lot of times, but you know, that's it's not a great old line, but uh, it's it's improving, it's developing, and for the last three years, they built an offensive line that was built around CJ Anderson running the football. Uh, they figured that was important when you had Peyton Manning out there. Uh, you know, the more balanced of an attack you have you know, the more mind games Peyton Manning can play with the defense. Uh, and that's why, that's why it worked out well for them. But uh, Simeon works well with that. I think he gets just enough time that his, his instincts are able to, to carry that team down the field. I think their running game with C.J. Anderson, you know, they've, the Broncos have, been, have had a decent running game at least these last two seasons. Uh, and we saw that come together last night. Uh, but... What, what you? I think if Brock Osweiler was back there, I the Broncos would probably still have the same record. They probably still have only lost two games at this point. Uh, but Brock, he doesn't. His decision making is not as good as Trevor Simeon's. It's not even close. Uh, you know, you watch Trevor. You watch Simeon when he drops back. He's. You can see his helmet scanning the field very quickly, and he throws it to the player that's open. Osweiler, he seems to play favorites a little more than you know you'd like to see in a quarterback, uh, and you know it, it kind of reminds me a lot of Dak Prescott in Dallas. You know, I it I think at this point we all know he should be the starting quarterback, even if Tony Romo is healthy. I frankly I think Tony Romo is healthy as we speak. They're just they're gonna say he's hurt so you know they that can be downplayed a little bit that Romo has lost his job um, <clears throat> what was I going on about it's the problem with just talking to yourself forever um, oh yeah Dak, Dak Prescott he he throws it to the to the receivers that are open you know Des Bryant hasn't been out there the last few weeks hasn't even been a problem and with Tony Romo he He's the more talented quarterback than Dak Prescott. At least he's, he's certainly got a better arm. He can throw it downfield. Um, I, I think Prescott's accuracy is almost flawless. Almost flawless. But Romo's still an accurate quarterback. But Tony Romo does play favorites. And that's why he's worked so well with having Des Bryant out there because Des is only happy as long as he's getting the football six to eight times a game. And, you know, I worry that, you know, when Des Bryant comes back, you're going to see... Prescott, you're going to see Prescott, you know, spread the ball around like he's done, and, you know, the Cowboys are going to play great, but then Des Bryant's not going to be happy. It's going to hurt the locker room. Basically, what I'm saying is the Cowboys should trade Des Bryant. You know, they they have an amazing offense that's young. They have the best offensive line in football. All right, Dak Prescott's going to be your quarterback for the future. Uh, even if Romo does come back in, I think that's certain. So you can trade Tony Romo this offseason, and you can trade Dak Prescott. Uh, it's a no-brainer. That defense is mediocre, but young, fast, improving. Dr get a first and a third rounder for each. You know, you could get a first and a third rounder for Tony Romo. Uh, trade him to Miami Dolphins. You know, they're not going to stick with Tannehill. He can be cut after this year. Uh, you know, get a first and a third rounder for him. Get a second rounder for Des Bryant. You know, so, something like that. And, and only draft defensive players. Uh, it's... There's a reason that Ezekiel Elliott, people are talking about him in the MVP race. It's not because of Ezekiel Elliott. He's a great running back, don't get me wrong. And certainly deserved to be drafted in the first round. But... He, he's, he's going through these easy trenches. Dak Prescott's comfortable in the pocket. He's, he clearly worked on that um, before entering the NFL on, you know, not scrambling as much. But, you know, he's good at throwing on the run. And if he needs to rush for a first down, he'll do it. So, you know, I, I think, you know, what, what I see from Dak Prescott is a lot 
of what I'm seeing from Trevor Simeon. Um, maybe not the most talented player out there, but his instincts are there. And, you know, Tom Brady could barely throw the ball 40 yards when he won his first Super Bowl. You don't need a quarterback with a strong arm. And I, I, I hate, you know, that's why people love Brett Favre, because he threw the ball like a Roldis Chapman out there. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you turn the ball over three or four times a game. You need a good decision maker. And, you know, the Broncos are in such a good situation now because they didn't re-sign Osweiler. He went to Houston. He made the right business decision for himself, assuming he's able to keep his job over the next few years. Uh, but so the, the Broncos didn't sign him, but now they have all the money in the world. Um, so that's going to help them going forward. And now they have Simeon. Now, again, I don't know if Simeon's going to be the quarterback of the future, uh, but you know he'll develop his skills over the years. And as long as those instincts are there, as long as he's able to read defenses and call audibles at the line, as long as he's able to do all of that, you know, the other stuff will come. And we know Denver has the best defense in the NFL. I mean, I'm sure the Minnesota Vikings are closer than a lot of us want to admit, but the Broncos still are the best defense. There's no doubt about it. And we saw Peyton Manning wasn't too great of a quarterback last year, and they still won the Super Bowl. So we know they can win with the mediocre offense. Now, build around Trevor Simeon or or develop Paxton Lynch and stick with Simeon. I mean, they're a Super Bowl contender. Uh, you know, Denver lost two games in a row and immediately they were written off. And, and now it seems like the Patriots are a shoe-in for the, for the uh, AFC championship. It, it seems like they're going, they're going to the Super Bowl. But uh, I don't think that's the case. I think whoever has the home game in the AFC title game is going to the championship. Uh, yeah, I think the Chargers could challenge. I think the Raiders and the Chiefs could challenge. All those teams in the West. But at the end of the day, it's probably going to come down to New England and Denver. Now, New England plays Denver in the middle of the season. Sorry, my camera just suddenly stopped there. Uh, but as I was saying, New England is playing Denver in Denver, which they always struggle in Denver. Uh, they're playing there, there later this season. I think it's like December 18th or something like that. It's maybe week 15, week 16. One of the last games of the season they're playing the Broncos. Uh, if they lose in Denver and they have the same record, the AFC Championship game is going to be in Denver. If that's the case, the Broncos are probably going to the Super Bowl. So, you know, they, they're in a really good position right now. And, you know, what they can do is with that extra money that they saved not re-signing Brock Osweiler, uh, they can use and build up that offense even more in the offseason. Uh, now, something they might do if Simeon doesn't work out, uh, or Paxson Lynch, uh, or maybe they, they think Paxson Lynch will be the future, but the Broncos could go after Tony Romo, and the Denver Broncos with Tony Romo is a scary team. Uh, you know, you got Emmanuel Sanders, you got Demarius Thomas, C.J. Anderson, and Tony Romo in the same offense. Uh, they may not be the best in the NFL, but when you have couple that with the best defense, uh, that's a Super Bowl favorite. Anyways, John Elway should be happy. He saved a boatload of money this offseason. He made the right decision not bringing Brock Osweiler back. I think Osweiler would be playing better with the Broncos, uh, but, you know, Denver's in a good position, and they're going to be a great, good team going forward. Uh, moving on, the World Series starts tonight. And, you know, who would have thought that the Cleveland Cavaliers, the night they finally receive their NBA championship rings, it's not even the biggest story in the city. The Cubs are in town, the Indians in the World Series. Again, nobody picked Cleveland to win it all. I think, every, like I said earlier, everyone was picking the Red Sox, or the Cubs and the Cubs to play in the World Series, and we got one of them. But of course, whenever the Cubs started lost any game in the postseason, everyone said that they're going to start choking now. Uh, so they're sticking to the narratives. The Red Sox went into the postseason with lots of exciting walk-offs. Uh, you know, flashy players like Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley. Uh, you know, fans are falling in love with this team, and then they just get swept in the first round by Cleveland. Nobody even knows anything about Cleveland other than they're. Their bullpen is amazing. Uh, they have a great manager, Terry Francona, a great postseason manager, especially. Uh, and they apply the Sabre metrics very well. I mean, it, I, I think, you know, I, I give Dave Roberts a lot of credit because, uh, you know, I was with the Dodgers earlier this season because I was chewing him out uh, back in April or May when he was, he'd have 
rookie pitchers going into the ninth or eighth or ninth inning with no hitters, and then he pulled them. He was the most conservative manager I'd ever seen, and and baseball, you know, I hate that. I think baseball is losing its appeal. You know, it's it's kind of hot right now because the Cubs are there, but generally baseball is losing its appeal, and I'd like to see managers make aggressive decisions because it makes the game more exciting. That being said, clearly Dave Roberts. You know, nobody nobody expected the Dodgers to make it as far as they did. I think Game Six in the NLCS is a, is an achie- that's an accomplishment. That is that is a good season for the LA Dodgers. And by by using saber metrics and applying and applying this conservative philosophy that Dave Roberts had in the regular season, it allowed him to be ultra aggressive in the postseason, which is why he brought Clayton Kershaw in the ninth. Clayton Kershaw out in the ninth inning of the ALDS to close things out. You know, people were saying, oh, that's that's idiotic. What's going to happen with Kershaw against the Cubs? And, you know, Kershaw did blow up against the Cubs. Uh, at, at least in game six he did. But... Uh, who cares? It doesn't matter. You're trying to win. You're trying to win every baseball game, and and those are sacrifices you make in the regular season, not the postseason. Oh, by the way, the person I'm talking about is Dusty Baker. He is kind of the old fart philosophy of baseball, which explains why the Washington Nationals never seem to be able to get out of the first round. I mean, I I don't think they have gotten out of the first round. Uh, they've been to the postseason a, a bunch of times at this point. Can't seem to get out of the the division series. They're the new Dodgers. Uh, but what, we, what we've seen from uh, the LA Dodgers, what made them so successful, is the same reason the Cleveland Indians are successful. You know, they, they play money ball. And, uh, you know, they, they were a conservative team that won 90 plus games under the radar this year. And now they have Terry Francona, who's proven to be successful in the postseason. He won the World Series in 04 and 07 with the Red Sox. So he's, I wouldn't say he's ultra aggressive like Dave Roberts, but you know, he, if, if his team's down by one run in the ninth, he's going to pinch run and try to steal that base. Francona makes those decisions in the postseason. Uh, so Cleveland has their shit together. We know that at this point. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they win at all. Uh, Chicago, clearly they have the advantage in hitting. They have the advantage in pitching. Uh, but... Cleveland has some success early in the game with their bullpen. They're going to be tough to beat. Uh, And, you know, honestly, personally, I'm rooting for Cleveland because the Cubs are going to win the World Series. If they don't do it this year, it'll be next year or the year after. Uh, That infield that they've developed is amazing. They have the best general manager in baseball, Theo Epstein, who, uh, you know, I mentioned sabermetrics and Moneyball. He took... Took Billy Bean's philosophy, made it better, won the World Series in Boston. He does money ball with money, and that's that's huge. So basically, the Cubs developed all this talent. And they have the best infield in baseball. They're all in their early 20s, and then they spend all their money on pitching. And Jake Arrieta, he needs to get his shit together. But you know, if John Lester pitches in three postseason games, which which he very well might if this goes seven, uh, you know, he's What's his ERA? 0.86 or something like that. He's he's unstoppable in the postseason. Uh, so the Cubs are going to win it if, if not this year, next year. So I wouldn't mind seeing this curse drag on just a little bit longer. <clears throat> all right. So that's all I'm going to say on baseball. Not making a prediction. I am rooting for the Cleveland Indians because I want the Cubs to to do well. Uh, I want the I want the Cubs to ride things out for the next few years. I want this tension that fans get. It's fun as a baseball fan. As a Red Sox fan, you know, I went through it a little bit. I didn't go through it as much as the older generations had with Bucky Dent and Bill Buckner, but I remember when Grady Little left Pedro in in the, uh, what was it, the seventh or the eighth inning, and he blew up the game, and, you know, the curse is real, and now I take joy in seeing Cubs fans suffer from that curse. But... I'm okay saying that because the Cubs fans have it good. They have a great team. They're going to win a World Series, if not this year, next year, the year after, or the year after that. So finally, NBA. Uh, Golden State Warriors, they're the big storyline going into this season, uh, which is nice because it's not all about LeBron James. It's not all about LeBron James. LeBron closed that chapter, 
And now we're all focusing on Kevin Durant, Draymond Green, Klay Thompson, Stephen Curry. Are they going to have chemistry issues? All this stuff. And, uh, you know, I... That, that's, that's what people are asking going into this season. And my opinion is yes, I think they're going to have chemistry issues. And if I had to pick a team to win the NBA title right now, it wouldn't be the Golden State Warriors. Um, it would probably be the Cleveland Cavaliers. Because as we saw, I, it's not, not because of talent or anything. We know they, <laughs> they have four players in their starting lineup that are in the top seven or eight players in the league. Uh, and three of those players, you can argue, are the three best players in the league. I, I disagree because LeBron belongs in there. But uh, there, there probably will be chemistry issues in Golden State because something is going on with Draymond Green right now. Uh, he got arrested this offseason. Uh, you know, I don't care too much about that. Shit happens. Uh, but I care more about what happened with him in Team USA, not the Snapchatting or any of that crap. I care that he... Uh, Mike Krzyzewski did barely played him. He had Draymond Green playing in garbage time uh, in the Olympics. And it doesn't matter in the Olympics. We knew Team USA was going to win it all. Draymond Green, I don't, I don't get the idea he was playing a lot of minutes. Uh, he didn't really fit with all that talent around. Uh, and now there's four players on Golden State that all shoot. That's their main skill set. Uh, Draymond Green, he's... he's He's a, that's probably not his main skill set, but he's a, he's a great defender and he he plays bigger than he actually is. But he's also a power forward that shoots lots of threes. So they got four of those guys in the same starting lineup. Now I'm not. I think this can work in Golden State and not other places because of the way they move the ball. The, the it's all moving the ball around the perimeter, uh, finding holes and and you know you can't cover all those guys at once. So you know Golden State is going to be successful. We know that they're probably going to be a number one seed or a number two. The Spurs could do something. Maybe the Clippers. Also watch out for the Minnesota Timberwolves. I. I think this could be the year they finally break out. Uh, but Golden State's probably going to be the number one seed. Uh, but again, Draymond Green, something's going on with him. And th it, there's reports that there are issues going on with him and head coach Steve Kerr. Kevin Durant is now there. And, you know, I don't, I don't think Durant is a cancer in the clubhouse, to use that cliche. I don't... I don't get that idea, but he does have an unusual personality. He's a bit aloof. Uh, you know, now he's in Golden State. He's got all these superstars around him. Uh, you know, he went to a, what was it, a Kanye concert a couple days ago and was in the middle of a... The okay, that's the last surprise cut, I promise. Uh, it turns out that an 8 gigabyte SD card isn't ideal for a podcast. Uh, it's like... Uh, it's to put it in sports terms, that's like asking Usain Bolt to run a marathon. It's it's not ideal. So uh, I can only do this a little bit longer because I'm running out of space. Uh, so just a few more minutes. Uh, but I'll, I'll continue on what I was saying about Kevin Durant. Uh, he's got a strange person that personality. He was in a mosh pit at a Kanye West concert two days before the start of the regular season. I'm not sure that's really what you want from the most coveted free agent of all time, uh, you know, well, well, I guess LeBron was too, but uh, it's, there's a lot of variables on this team, and a lot of players that are good at doing the same thing, uh, but I, th I think the reason why the Warriors aren't going to win the NBA Finals this year uh, is their depth issues. You know, they, they added Kevin Durant, but they lost a lot of players. Just read down the list. They lost Maurice Spates, Harrison Barnes, Andrew Bogut, Festus Azili. Uh, you know, that if, for an 82 game regular season, which in my opinion is way too long in the NBA, uh, those players are going to get tired. And, you know, I think last year, if you know, with 20 games to go, if the Warriors had, you know, not gone for the record, if they had put on the brakes and, you know, rotated their players, resting them, you know, every three games, rest Stephen Curry or something, you know, that, that might have made a difference in the NBA Finals. That probably would have been enough. Um, but, you know, not only did they lose depth, they lost size. And they almost lost to the Oklahoma City Thunder last year because they were outmatched down low. Uh, they were just beat up. And they... You know, Azili, Bogut, 
Spates, those are the kind of players that beat other players up. They don't even have them. Kevin Durant, you know, superstar, but he's not the most physical player. Uh, so you got Draymond Green, but we know you get him a little upset and it causes issues. Uh, you know, I, I we didn't really notice it until last postseason uh, in the NBA, but Draymond Green's been like that. It, it, you know, he... There was a time when everyone thought that was a good thing because he was the emotional energy of the team. But, you know, when you kick a player in the nuts once every five games, that's going to hurt your team. and He's probably going to get suspended. Uh, so, you know, the, the Cleveland Cavaliers, they they added uh, Chris Anderson. They brought back J.R. Smith. They got everyone back. Uh, you know, Anderson makes them more physical. And that's a good pickup. Uh, they match up very well. If there's one thing they didn't have in the finals last year, it was that physicality. They depended entirely on Tristan Thompson in that department. Uh, they, they didn't even play Mozgov. Uh, so, you know, they had Kevin Love out there, but, he, you know, he's not the most physical power forward, and he, he spends a lot of his time out on the perimeter. Uh, but they lost, the Cavaliers have grown in depth. The Warriors lost a ton in depth. Uh, you know, if they're not willing to rest their players, which I think they learned their lesson, I think they will. Um, but when once you're getting, if they're not willing to rest their players enough, that's going to hurt them in the postseason. And also, the postseason is a whole nother season. It lasts for two and a half months in the NBA. There's no other postseason in sports other than the NHL uh, that, that's like that. But let's face it, hockey players are just tougher and they're wearing pads. Um, NBA players, you know, they're they're running five miles a game, and basketball is a physical sport. And you know, th these guys have already played an 82 game regular season, a lot of back to backs. Uh, you know, if the Warriors don't get their rest, if they they can't come up with a good rotation, enough bench players that can pick up the slack when uh, you know three out of the four stars are having a rough night. Uh, it, it's going to be troubling, and they may not even win the Western Conference if that's the case. You know, San Antonio, uh, San Antonio, it's not an easy pick because we saw last year that Lamarcus Aldridge isn't always the best fit for that offense. But he's had an entire offseason. Tim Duncan is out of the way, uh, so yeah, and he has the best coach in the NBA. Uh, so you, you would think Aldridge will fix whatever issues he's had meshing with that lineup. So you know the Spurs are going to challenge them. Watch out for the Clippers. Uh, so uh, you know I haven't spent much time talking about the Eastern Conference other than the Cavs, uh, Miami Heat. They lost Dwayne Wade. They're still great. I, I'm not counting on Chicago. Uh, I like Jimmy Butler. I like Dwayne Wade. But I don't like those guys both playing with Rajon Rondo. That Rondo, uh, he worked with Doc Rivers when he had Garnett yelling at him on the bench. But I don't know if Rondo's really going to work out well for that team. If Tom Thibodeau was still there, it would be a different story. I think Thibodeau would discipline Rondo. But uh, yeah, speaking of Thibodeau, he's now in Minnesota. That's going to be a good team. I mean, the, at some point, that team has to blossom into something, but they've been on the right track the last three seasons. Andrew Wiggins, he'll be entering his third year. 47% uh, of the NBA GM said they would pick Carl Anthony Towns uh, if they were starting a team from scratch, which is absurd because LeBron James still has five or six great years left. Durant's still there. You have Draymond, Steph Curry, Russell Westbrook. I think I would pick those players over Carl Anthony Towns, but you know that just comes to show what they think this Timberwolves team is capable of. Thibodeau is a great coach. He didn't get along with ownership in Chicago. Uh, this is a good fit, Minnesota. Uh, I would be worried about that team in the Western Conference. They could surprise people, uh, not only just be a playoff team, they could surprise people and be top four or five seed in uh, the Western Conference, which isn't as competitive as it's been in years past. Uh, so yeah, I gotta wrap this thing up. Uh, finally, why is this the best time of the year? Because right now is the only time you have NFL, NBA, and baseball, and hockey at the same time. Now. I think baseball probably go, shouldn't go into November. You know, uh, games on in Chicago, games on Lake Erie in Cleveland, uh, they're not uh, good in November. And if that's in New York, if that's in Boston, it's even worse. Uh, 
or even Seattle, you know, if they're, they're in the postseason. Baseball shouldn't be played in November. I don't know what they should do. Shorten spring training. It seems too long anyway. Or maybe move it back. You know, start a little bit earlier. Start the season a week early. You know, I'd rather play those cold, potentially snowy games in April or, or late March than playing them in November. But at the same time, it's exciting because I have two TVs. I'm going to have the World Series on one. Uh, I'm going to have the NBA on the other. It's going to be a lot of fun. So this is the best time of the year to be alive. Uh, also in LA, it's not unbearably hot, which is where I currently am. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that wasn't so hard. I, I, I totally can talk to myself for a while. Uh, I, I would have gone a little bit longer, but, you know, again, I have an SD card that is way too small. So I'm going on Amazon. I'm going to order a new one. Uh, I'm sure I'll be back this week. This is a lot of fun. I kind of like it better. I don't have to do as much video editing. I don't have to watch myself or listen to myself talk as much, which everyone hates. Uh, so, you know, instead I'm just going to put my face on the Internet for a very long time and hope that works out. Uh, but... Yeah, uh, be back. Subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening somewhere, click whatever button you need to tune in more. Uh, my Twitter is at the Brad Whitaker, and uh, yeah, I'll see you later.